Day 167 of the war in Gaza. The IDF operation at Shifa Hospital in Gaza City is ongoing. IDF Chief Herzi Halevi visited troops at the hospital and told them that the operation is causing severe damage to Hamas's leadership. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. Entering Gaza City and joining troops in the ongoing operation at Shifa Hospital, IDF Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi said the IDF was putting pressure on Hamas with regard to a potential hostage deal. Halevi said the IDF is dismantling Hamas, killing its military leadership, damaging its civilian leadership, and killing or capturing its operatives. IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari was at Shifa and gave a briefing on the ongoing operation. In this compound, many Hamas terrorist operatives and senior ones have been hiding in the hospital. And also Islamic Jihad group has been hiding in this hospital. When we entered the hospital, we were finding terrorists fighting against us here in this area. Until now, we have arrested over 250 Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists that we identified. We are still conducting an investigation of over another 350 people that we suspect that they are also connected to terror. The operation was carried out with great care to not hurt patients or medical personnel. Until now, none, civilians, doctors, medic teams, none have been hurt. Only the terrorists. We are supplying food, water. We have supplied yesterday two generators to the emergency room because there was a problem with electricity. We are supplying also technicians to fix the problems inside the emergency room and the generators. We are also supplying medic teams to assist with everything or anything that is needed. Among the captured is Mahmoud Kouasme, a senior Hamas operative involved in the planning of the 2014 kidnapping and murder of Eyal Yifrach, Gilad Sher, and Naftali Frankel. He is being held for questioning after being captured at Gaza City's Shifra Hospital. We call Hamas terrorists to surrender. We call it and we speak by Arabic speakers here on the ground, but they are still hiding in this building, in the emergency room, exploiting and using the patients and the medic teams. Meanwhile, the IDF is operating in a limited way in Rafah. Five senior Hamas officials have been targeted over the past week. They deny the kidnapping of our children, the murder of our grandchildren, the rape of our daughters. The new Nazis we face today will stop at nothing to destroy civilization as we know it. The World Jewish Congress was created exactly for these times like this, so every Jew can fall asleep at night knowing they are safe in their own home. We are a voice for the Jewish people everywhere. We are the World Jewish Congress. And U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says gaps are closing in mediated talks in Doha for the release of Israeli hostages in exchange for an extended pause in the Gaza war. Speaking to a Saudi newspaper in Jeddah en route to Egypt and then Israel, Blinken said an agreement is very much possible. More from ILTV's Devo Klein. Speaking in Jeddah before stops in Cairo and Tel Aviv, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken blamed Hamas for not accepting the earlier offers and coming back with new demands. But Blinken said an agreement is now very much possible. Blinken said we worked very hard with Qatar, Egypt and Israel to put a strong proposal on the table. Hamas wouldn't accept it. They came back with other demands. The negotiators now in Doha are working on that right now. I believe it's very doable and very necessary, Blinken added. 
The Qatari Foreign Ministry said it was too early to say the sides were nearing a deal, as negotiators got down to brass tacks in hopes of reaching an elusive agreement to pause fighting for at least six weeks and secure the release of at least 40 hostages held captive in Gaza. The deal would also include the release of hundreds of Palestinian security prisoners. A pause in fighting would not necessarily be at the cost of a Rafah operation. Prime Minister Netanyahu now says it will take some time until the IDF launches the offensive in Rafah. Netanyahu's comments came days after his phone call with U.S. President Joe Biden, and it was agreed that Israel would send a team to Washington to discuss the Rafah plan. The prime minister still insisted that the operation in Rafah is still on the agenda. And as the IDF continues operating in Shifa Hospital, ILTV's Rachel Safdi visited Ichilov Hospital in Tel Aviv today. Rachel, what can you tell us? Hi, Lidar. Well, yes, I'm standing here in front of Ichilov Hospital in Tel Aviv. I've actually just heard a military helicopter coming in, most probably bringing in wounded soldiers from Gaza. And what's interesting about the medical team in this hospital and in Israeli hospitals in general is that the doctors and nurses team, they're made up of people that are Jewish, uh, that are Muslim, that are Christian, that are Jews, of all sorts of religions and cultures that save the lives of Israelis and Palestinians every day. It's important to note that Israeli hospitals actually treat Palestinians. Uh, in 2014, we actually saw the daughter of Hamas leader Ismail Khaniye being treated in this hospital right behind me. And that just goes to show the contrast between this hospital and the Al Shifa hospital, for example, the largest hospital uh, in the Gaza Strip, where the IDF has been conducting a raid since Monday morning. As we've heard, they've already uh, eliminated 90 terrorists. They've taken hundreds in for questioning by the 504 unit and by the Shin Bet. Uh, and that just goes to show uh, the huge contrasting difference from a hospital like this that will save the lives of Gazans uh, and a hospital in Gaza that is used as a terror center to kill Israelis. And Rachel, what can you tell us uh, about the latest with the hostage negotiations uh, taking place? Yeah, so what's interesting regarding this last round of negotiations is that we received reports when the Israeli delegation uh, went to Doha, Qatar, uh, for, for this current round, that they were extremely pessimistic. They did not believe a deal uh, would come out of this as Hamas has continuously denied all offers and have been changing their requests. And so the reports were um, that most probably no deal would come out of this round of negotiations. And yet now U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, who's on his sixth trip to the Middle East since the beginning of this war, has actually said that the gaps are closing and that he's actually optimistic and he does see a deal coming out of this round of negotiations. We would most probably see a deal where in the first round 40 hostages uh, would get released, including female soldiers, uh, the elderly and the wounded. Uh, and so, and he also criticized Hamas for not taking and not accepting the deals uh, beforehand. And so he's optimistic we might be able to see a deal in the next few weeks. Well, the Biden administration has expressed optimism before, but let's hope this time we'll see a deal. Thank you, Rachel. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. And moving on, Israel remains adamant that an operation in Rafah is the only way to victory. This despite the international opposition and pressure that continues to mount even from its closest allies. 
Joining us now to discuss Israel's military strategy and a potential Rafah operation is Joe Terzman, senior research analyst at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy's Long War Journal. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to insist that the only way to fully eradicate Hamas is by going into Rafah, and he said that he's already approved uh, the IDF's operational plan. What can you tell us about a potential Rafah operation? What would it entail, uh, and would this mark the end of Hamas? Right, so this is very important. I think it's noteworthy to mention that Rafah is only a one piece of the overall puzzle right now. Rafah is important for the IDF for two big reasons. The IDF wants to remove or eliminate the remaining Hamas battalions uh, that are continuing to operate in Rafah. Uh, also, we have to note that it's not just Hamas operating in Rafah, it's, Islam, it's Islamic Jihad and uh, many other Palestinian terrorist organizations. Secondly, uh, there's the Philadelphia uh, Corridor, the uh, border between Egypt and the Gaza Strip. There are tunnels there. Uh, so these the tunnels are being have been used to transfer weapons. Uh, what the IDF needs to do there, their aim is to remove those tunnels, destroy them. So this is very important to the, uh, to the IDF. However, uh, they have to consider the civilian population. Uh, so this is there's, there are many factors in play here, but Rafah, in the end, is just one piece of the overall puzzle in this war. You know, Israel is sending a team to the U.S. to discuss alternatives to Rafah uh, that the Biden administration is going to present. Are there, in your view, viable alternatives? I think what the Israel and the United States are trying to do is uh, reach a compromise, right, uh, as far as what's happening, especially in Rafah. So, because uh, I just don't think Israel can defeat Hamas and, and other Palestinian terrorist organizations just with uh, pinpoint attacks, right, uh, or airstrikes. It just can't happen. And we got to remember, there's tunnels underneath Rafah, right, uh, and in other areas in the southern Gaza Strip that need ground troops. So, uh, I think a compromise will have to uh, will have to be agreed upon by both parties, the U.S. and Israel. But we'll see what happens. Israel has been talking about going into Rafah for weeks, uh, but has yet to do so. Uh, and Netanyahu said that while he's approved a plan, it will take time to implement. So what is Israel waiting for? I mean, if Rafah is a strategic area, why hasn't the IDF already gone in? Is it solely due to international pressure? Right. That's the million dollar question, I think, right now. Uh, it's, I think you said it, uh, international pressure. We have to think back. So the at the beginning of the operation of the war, uh, the Israeli, is the IDF uh, had to go into the north, into Gaza City, for example, and Khan Yunus uh, further south. Now we have to remember, it's not they didn't receive, they did not, they were not under that much international pressure during that time. Now, right, almost six months into the war that we're seeing, it's uh, it, it, things have changed, and Rafah is holding, or there are hundreds of thousands of Palestinians taking shelter there. So uh, on top of that, we have the international pressure. So I think what's happening is Israel, uh, specifically uh, Bibi Netanyahu, is considering is, is is considering what to do here, right? Even though he's implemented the plan or has approved the plan, uh, he wants to make sure everything is right here, okay? He wants to um, ensure that this war, this operation in Rafah is a success, and that's why they're taking their time Plus, we have to. I think the Israel has to evacuate civilians, like it did in Khan Yunus and other city areas in the northern Gaza Strip. So, uh, nevertheless, Israel is taking its time, uh, but I think it's for a good reason. But eventually, I think they will go into Rafah. You know, we've seen in the past few days uh, Hamas also returning to Shifa Hospital, returning to uh, the northern Gaza Strip after Israel believed those areas to be secure. Uh, and after the Isra Israeli withdrawal from that area. So what does this mean looking forward? How many Hamas terrorists has Israel eradicated? How many more are left? Uh, and can Israel ensure terrorists won't return to areas that it's already cleared? Correct. So it's difficult to say how many terrorists have been killed, right? Uh, at least uh, members of Hamas and other Palestinian terrorist organizations. I, uh, I think it's, in the, uh, it's pretty high. It's in the, I think it's more than 10,000, all right? Uh, nevertheless, I think the uh, Israel is still, the IDF is, is still having to uh, fight the resurgence 
of uh, terrorism or terrorists in the north, especially in the northern Gaza Strip. Uh, you got to remember, there's a vast tunnel network underneath the Gaza Strip. Israel has not found all the tunnels, all right? So there's still active tunnels that I, that I think, that I believe that these terrorists are using to move south to north, all right? And this is why we're seeing operations like Shifa Hospital. And then there's other areas in the northern Gaza Strip where there are issues too. So it's not just Shifa Hospital. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we have to remember also that Israel said in the beginning, this is going to take time, all right? This isn't going to happen in a, they're not going to eradicate Hamas and their military infrastructure and the other groups' military infrastructure in weeks or uh, a few months, all right? This is what we're seeing now. It's going to take time. So uh, nevertheless, what Israel needs, again, more than anything, is time and support from its allies. Absolutely. Joe Terzman, thank you so much for your analysis today. Thank you. And turning now to the tense Ramadan security situation in Judea and Samaria, the IDF has targeted terrorists operating out of Jenin and Tulkarem in a pair of drone strikes. ILTV's Steve Leibovitz has the report. The first drone strike was in Jenin. The IDF in Shin Bet confirmed it eliminated Ahmed Barakat, an Islamic Jihad terrorist, long wanted for a string of deadly attacks. Barakat was behind a deadly shooting attack in Judea and Samaria last year, near the settlement of Khermesh in May of 2023, killing Meir Tamari. In the same drone attack, two other Palestinian terror operatives were killed and a third seriously wounded. The four were senior Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives. Hours later, the IDF launched an operation in Nur Shams, east of Tolkarim. During the operation, an aircraft struck two terrorists who posed an immediate threat to the forces. The drone strike kicked off what the IDF said was a brigade-level raid in Nur Shams, near Tolkarim. This was the 46th airstrike that the IDF conducted in Judea and Samaria since the war in Gaza began over five months ago. Security forces in Jerusalem and the territories have been on high alert since Ramadan started last week. Tensions have been especially high since the October 7th Hamas massacre. Since October 7th, the IDF said troops have arrested some 3,500 wanted Palestinians across Judea and Samaria, including more than 1,500 affiliated with Hamas. And Jews around the world are getting ready to celebrate Purim. It's a holiday that marks the victory over those that sought the destruction of the Jewish people. And this year, in the midst of the war for Israel's survival, this holiday takes on an even more important meaning. Joining us now to discuss the significance of this holiday is founding rabbi at the Tel Aviv International Synagogue, Rabbi Ariel Constantine. Thank you for joining us. So what exactly are we celebrating on Purim? Purim is a celebration of the victory of the Jews against uh, an evil reign of Haman in Persia. I'm talking about uh, about 2,500 years ago that sought to uh, annihilate the nation, uh, mass genocide. Um, when men and children out of pure hatred for the Jewish people and to enrich the coffers of the Persian Empire. And uh, thanks to the heroism of uh, Queen Esther, who was the queen of Persia, selected by the King Ahasuerus, along with her uncle Mordechai, who helped guide her and advise her, we were able to overturn the evil decree. We were able to defend ourselves against uh, the anti-Semites who were, were plotting our mass, you know, massacre and slaughter. And uh, it turned out from uh, an evil decree to a joyous holiday that uh, we felt uh, God's salvation and uh, ability to uh, protect our people. And we're here today thanks to that uh, miracle, that victory. And so what are some of the symbols of this holiday? I mean, we know of the Hamantaschen, uh, for example, but, but what does it signify? Well, Hamantaschen itself symbolizes uh, kind of Haman's ears, uh, so to speak, because according to tradition, they were pointy and somewhat triangular. Um, we poke a little bit of fun at the enemy uh, rather than you know, infusing hate. We want to just kind of have fun and saying, you know, they didn't succeed and we did and we were we survived. So we boo and make noise whenever his name is mentioned. And when we read the Megillah, which is the story of the uh, of what happened during Purim, which we read on Purim in the evening and in the morning. So we kind of make a lot of noise at our synagogue, at Aviv International Synagogue. We we have a whole band and we make call the music and depending on what's happening in the theme of the Megillah, we have a little bit of like a, a short clip of what's happening to blot out his name. We have a lot of other customs like dressing up um, and uh, masquerades, uh, Adeloyada or parades. 
And then there's also the mitzvot of the day, which are very special. We have, besides hearing the Megillah, which is an important one, which is hearing the story, we give gifts to one another called Mishloach Manot. Uh, we gave gifts this year to uh, wounded soldiers and to the families of the hostages to give them a little bit of Purim cheer through this really horrific time that they're going through. Uh, we give gifts to the poor, and we have a festive meal, usually with accompanied by jokes and some drinking and and some levity and, and happiness to be able to celebrate the victory of uh, you know of the Jews over Haman and the evil Amalek. You know, you mentioned the Ad Loyada, uh, the parades, and everyone here in Israel dresses up in costumes. Though this year, uh, due to the war, the celebrations are more muted. But uh, is this a part of the celebration as well? We will see here in Israel this year. Well, I think this year is definitely a very unique year. It's it's very mixed emotions uh, coming into this Purim in terms of dressing up and fun, having fun and partying when we have 134 hostages still uh, in Gaza and we have the soldiers still fighting and, and, and sacrificing their lives. It's it's challenging, and yet I think that uh, it's important that the uh, we continue to celebrate because we do have faith in God that as he brought us to salvation in the past, God willing, he'll bring us to salvation this time around as well. We would not to let Hamas show that they have dampened our spirits, but we continue to live and to have joy and we will not uh, be beaten down by the evil of Hamas uh, like we weren't beaten down by the evil of, of Haman and uh, Amalek back in the day. And uh, that uh, send a message that uh, Am Yisrael Chai, we're alive and well, we're going to continue celebrating, we're going to continue fighting for good and uh, try to eradicate evil and bring uh, peace to our people and to the world, God willing. And Rabbi Constantine, thank you so much for joining us today and happy Purim. Thank you so much. And moving on, Israelis suffered a national tragedy on October 7th. There is not a person in Israel that doesn't know someone who was affected by this day and the ongoing war. And yet, Israelis are also a resilient people. And this is reflected in the latest 2024 World Happiness Report that found that despite the war, Israelis are still a happy people. Just how happy? Well, ILTV's Ariela Lechiani is here to tell us all about it. Ariela, so... How did Israel rank this year in the World Happiness Report? So Israel came fifth this year, which is amazing. It's only one place lower than last year when they came fourth. And I think given the circumstances and during a war in the wake of October 7th, to come fifth is really astonishing. And it's also worth noting that they also conducted a report for under 30s. And they came, Israel came second in that second one. Second in the second world. Second in the world for under 30s to live. So For under 30 year olds. Yeah. So it's really something special and I think to be honest it's just a massive testament to the resilience of the Israeli people. Mm -hmm. So all this despite the war I mean that's really uh, quite incredible. Yeah well it's it's worth noting that the they're measuring happiness not just on if you're feeling happy one day or sad one day it's not about fleeting feeling it's more um, an evaluation of life so in that comes economy, healthcare, social involvement and that's something that we see has remained really stable in spite of a war um, in spite of the whole nation grieving. Um, and I think that just shows that for Israel, the quality of civilian life is really a priority above everything. Um, if we're looking at the individual factors, positive emotion has lowered and in turn negative emotion has risen. But that's a given, that's understandable. But if you look at it all together, uh, the satisfaction of life has, re has remained stable. Incredible. And really quickly, who beat out Israel? Who ranked uh, in the top four? So above Israel was Finland, Denmark, Sweden and uh, Iceland, which isn't surprising. They seem to be up there every year, but Israel's just behind. So that's what counts. Absolutely. And a testament to the resilience uh, of the Israeli people. Ariella, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Rainy showers are expected tonight and in the north and cloudy skies in the south with temperatures reaching lows of around 13 degrees Celsius or 56 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, partly cloudy skies around the country and highs of 18 degrees Celsius or 65 degrees Fahrenheit. More rain is expected over the weekend in the north. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Ladarga Velazi. Be well, stay safe, and thank you so much for watching.